So, welcome to Jennergate. No, not that Jenner. But it's an episode about swapping parts. So, maybe? I don't know. Um, what happened? Well, remember COVID and supply chain? I'm hoping maybe Annie will do a cameo here and talk about supply chain and put us all to sleep for a bit. But nonetheless, we could talk about supply chain forever. It turns out that people, in general, don't like to work. And apparently some of those people work for companies like Onan Cummins and uh, some of the companies that supply components to Onan Cummins. So now, with the increased demand for generators and decreased supply of generators, it seems that uh, there are no generators. As I said in our previous episode, we closed on our Lagoon 46 on a Friday before the last episode, and Monday I got a call from Navigar telling me, Lagoon just let us know there's no generator for your boat and there's no way of getting one for a year. Yes, a year. I was not happy. At first I thought, wow, this is really foul play. Navigar must have known. Um, it turns out Lagoon knew, but Navigar did not. And that was really reassuring because I really liked my partners at Navigar and I'm glad to see that all that was not their fault at all and really just a company they work with not doing their job of keeping the people they work with in the know. So, we're going to talk a lot about energy sources in this week uh, and go over why you need a generator, how you can work without a generator, what you can do, uh, other approaches for energy sources on a boat. So lots of stuff eats lots of power on boats, but the number one consumer on luxury boats is the AC. Um, air conditioning, there are six AC units on a Lagoon 46. Two in the living room, one in each of the cabins, uh, or if you have an owner's suite, one in the owner's cabin and one forward in the owner's very large kind of dressing room, bathroom thing that they have there, which we have and I love. Um, so air conditioning, uh, each unit uses about a kilowatt an hour. And if you ran all six all day, you'd use up 144 kilowatt hours in a single day. Oh, that's crazy. And very few boats do that. Usually people are a little smarter about power management on, on yachts when they're chartering them, they shut things down, try to economize. But this is the charter business and a lot of our people who are using them will use as much power as you give them. We're hoping to educate our customers a bit about why they may want to go a little leaner than that and how that's good for the environment, good for the boat, good for us, good for systems, good for their wallet because they're not wasting a ton of diesel fuel making power that they don't need. Uh, but AC is the single biggest consumer. Uh, after that, all the other stuff combined doesn't even matter, but you do have energy intense systems that have high kilowatt draws like microwaves, washer dryers on this boat, a dishwasher, um, and the water maker, all of which uh, draw large amounts of energy for relatively short periods of time, but also could be used concurrently and all together have the ability to draw about eight kilowatts of energy out of the system at any time. Now, usually what happens is people turn on too many things, they trip a breaker and then Someone has to go and do magic and flip all the switches, and then people use less of it, and over time people learn. Uh, we're hoping that's not going to be such a case on our boat uh, with the way that we're designing things. So let's talk about that. So what are the sources you can have on a boat for energy? The easiest one is shore power, kind of. Although, again, we were faced with a specific challenge on our boat because our boat is configured for Europe and we picked it up at the last minute. We got a great deal, but it needed some modifications to be able to run in the uh, 60 Hertz environment of our uh, Western power systems. Now, um, 60 Hertz, 50 Hertz, what does it mean? Well, it really goes back to how AC power is generated and it has to do with the number of times these uh, magnets are sweeping by um, uh, other magnets and coils. 
Um, this drives energy through in a pump-like fashion, and each one of those pumps is a cycle. So if it's spinning slower, it's 50 hertz. Now in Europe, uh, they have a bigger voltage differential. So um, they actually run 230 uh, volts on their systems, and it's a, what's called a three-pole system. And so they run through and they go from zero to uh, 230 volts, um, a total of 50 times a second or 50 Hertz. Uh, in our systems, we run 110 volts at 60 Hertz in the United States or 120 volts at 60 Hertz. And that's kind of six, one half a dozen of the other. Uh, but when we plug two of those in, um, they're running at a 240 volts at uh, 60 Hertz. So in driving these systems, we have to figure out a way of pumping energy through uh, our systems from shore power and changing it from 60 Hertz to 50 Hertz, or 50 Hertz to 60 Hertz, sorry. No, I spoke right the first time. It's changing it from the 60 Hertz on shore to the 50 Hertz that our European appliances want to see. So it turns out that only a few of our appliances really care. Our air conditioners don't care. They're happy with 50 or 60 Hertz. The delicate electronics in the washer dryer, the dishwasher and the microwave are very uh, cycle dependent and don't like that at all. And I still haven't heard back from the water maker supplier whether or not they care, but it'll be irrelevant. And we'll talk about all that next week. Uh, this week, we're solely talking about how we're going to get power, period, on the boat without the Cummins generator that was supposed to get dropped up front. So another place that people get power and are increasingly taking more power out of are engines. Um, alternators, which you've probably heard of, uh, are hooked up to the belt system in the engine, and they're little, basically, generators that generate uh, uh AC energy and then convert that to DC energy through what's called a rectifier and then feed it out at a certain voltage. Now our boat comes with standard 12 volt alternators that charge the batteries and the basic systems of the boat. Uh, and I'll get into that in a minute. We're gonna do something different there too. Um, there's solar power. We're adding a substantial amount of power to this boat through solar. Um, it comes with a little bit from Lagoon and I would highly recommend to anybody looking at a Lagoon never buy the Lagoon system. This boat came with it, so I'm kind of stuck, but the system has 460 watts of solar across the whole back. There are a lot of other people who are getting 14 or 1600 watts for the same cost off a custom built rack over the dinghy. Um, so this is a very small system back there. It's okay for how we're gonna end up using it, and I'll explain that uh, more about that next week, but a little bit today. And then finally, there are uh, hydropower systems. Now there's two different kinds now because some people are doing hybrid electric drives which are super cool and I would love to be doing but again I bought a boat off the shelf. This ain't gonna be now but down the road um, that's a really cool option especially in a sailboat uh, where you have a generator that's charging batteries and running your electric but once you're sailing you can actually use your props uh, spin them backwards and drive generators on the boat uh, or in, in the electric drives that then feed right back into your batteries, uh, recycling them. And these systems have been around for eight, 10 years now, but they're gaining in popularity and the cost drops every year. I still think we're at a very steep point in that curve. And I think if you can wait a few years, you're gonna be able to pick up a unit for a quarter of the price that they are today. And they're gonna eventually replace typical gas propulsion systems because they require so much less maintenance. Um, and it really depends how you're using them and we'll get to that in a bit. So the other types are like Watt and C's, and you may have heard about these. They're, uh, they look like outboard engines almost, and you flip them down in the water, a propeller spins, and it sends battery, it sends uh, voltage back to a battery bank. Uh, finally, another spinning type thing is a uh, wind, and we've all seen and heard uh, wind generators on uh, boats and marinas. Tend to be very noisy. Um, Dangerous, uh, probably the most dangerous if you don't mount them really high. Um, susceptible to wind damage and another thing to watch out for if you're in a high wind area. And they look kind of clunky. I mean, just to be honest, like I understand and, and I would install one if I was like 
uh, around the world remote cruiser. I could see why you put it up there. I've had some thoughts about how you'd install one, but for our pretty charter boat, not going to happen. Um, so, uh, when you buy a boat factory from Lagoon, they have no ability to store that energy out of the generator. Uh, this is a, a big problem and I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, primary storage on a boat. This again is a next week topic, but I have to mention it first just because some stuff we're going to do. But next week when we're talking about the system design, I'm going to go into great detail about what we did here. Uh, today we're really going to talk about generators um, and alternators and how to make all this work with a lot less uh, and how those interface with battery systems. But the two basic types are AGM batteries, um, which are no longer having liquid sloshing around on them. Uh, they're a lot cheaper and they're a lot heavier than uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries, which is what we'll be using on our boat, which are lighter, more expensive, but also for their rated amp hours, like the problem with rated amp hours is that uh, really have to almost have that in general um, for the number of kilowatt hours you can take out of the batteries. Because when you go super low on a battery bank, you actually uh, kill the number of cycles. So a lot of these lithium batteries are now touting 5,000 cycles before they uh, stop working and that they'll get to 80% of their rated capacity of 5,000 cycles. Um, that's great. In 5,000 cycles, if you cycle your batteries once a day, is 15 years. And if you do it twice a day, it's still seven or eight years. Um, so possibly a very low maintenance. But if all of a sudden you go down to an 80% depth of discharge, it drops to like 2,000 cycles. And then all of a sudden you're talking about between three and five years of useful life out of these batteries. Um, and at $20,000 for the batteries we're putting in, that all of a sudden adds up to a significant operational expense. Now, of course, if you know you're going to be taking out a certain amount of power, if you're uh, dropping out, you're dropping your cycles half as much and your initial investment is half, I don't know that you're really per watt hour having the same types of problems, but we're going to try to keep ours at about a 50% depth of discharge max. And we'll get more into that. But basically, if you have a 20 kilowatt hour battery bank, um, which is about the size we're putting in, you can take out 10, maybe 12 kilowatt hours per, or per cycle before you're really injuring the system. So we're gonna try to keep our batteries never going below that 45% uh, mark and really hopefully rarely going below the 55% mark. Um, so first source of power, of course, shore power. Um, if your boat's configured for this country, shore power is a super easy thing. There are these things called isolation transformers. Uh, they decrease this galvanic uh, cycle that causes your stuff to corrode and is why you need to always be changing anodes on a boat. Um, basically, you sacrifice the zinc anode and that allows the boat to um, be all have its, all of its other systems protected from corrosion. Otherwise, you're constantly turning your metal into salt, basically, uh, metal salts. And that's bad and can lead to disastrous results. Uh, I'll just let you look at these pictures. Um, so we'll have an isolation transformer. It'll actually serve two purposes on our boat uh, due to the switch from European configuration to US configuration. Um, there are various types. They have various capacities. They're heavy. They're very heavy. 100 pounds, a lot of them. Um, but you need to have them. They're about a thousand bucks. Ours will have an isolation transformer. It didn't come with one. Only thing to know about shore power other than make sure you have the right voltage cycle and uh, amperage coming into your boat for your needs. Uh, we're going to have to build a totally different shore power system on Bella because she's configured to take European power. We're going to leave that one there. We're going to add a second US one in case somebody ever wants to take her into the wild blue yonder. Why take it off? So we'll just add one rather than rewiring it. And that again has to do with voltage and amperage. Uh, these higher voltage European systems use half as many amps to move the same amount of power. I'll mention this several times, but watts are amps times volts. So if you have a 10 volt uh, system running at 10 amps, 
you have 100 watts. If you have a 12 volt system running at 10 amps, you have 120 watts. So on a US system, plugging into your wall, a hairdryer uh, uses um, about 10 amps of electricity, uh, between 10 and 12 amps, so 1500 watt is closer to 13 amps of draw. Uh, and you need a substantial wire as you begin to get into these higher amperages. Amperages is the amount of energy moving through and voltage is the power of each bit of energy moving through. Uh, I'm not a physicist, but that's, that's true. Um, so short power in the U.S. relatively cheap, not always, um, especially not in Texas right now, uh, but short power is going up all the time. And when Annie and I were in uh, Atlantis uh, last year, our electric bill for two days was like 60 bucks. Um, and uh, I'm seeing stuff all over the place about uh, people getting outrageous bills at Marina, 70 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and at 70 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, it's cheaper to make your own off your generator. Um, it's close, but it's about the same, even with all the maintenance costs. So our generator makes uh, 18 kilowatts, 19 kilowatts for one gallon of diesel. Um, and the generator we ended up going with, sorry to spoil the surprise, we did actually buy a generator yesterday. Um, but it's a small, very fuel efficient one. Uh, and so uh, using one gallon for 18 kilowatts, uh, even at, let's say, bad prices right now, which are about six bucks a gallon, um, you're still only talking about 33 cents a kilowatt versus 70 cents. But if you have solar, it's free. Uh, so um, every day our boat's going to generate about 17 kilowatt hours. Um, which at shore prices is at least five to 10 bucks a day, more like 10 bucks a day, or all of our solar panels together are gonna to cost about $3,500. Installing them and all the other parts of it, it's gonna be another 2,000 plus another $500 worth of equipment. So we're talking about $6,000, we'll save about $2,700 a year in electricity uh, minimum. Uh, off solar and probably way more than that. Um, also, it's redundant. We've added a layer of redundancy to our system, super important. And it's enough to run all the systems except for running AC all day, um, which gets us to our next problem. Now, if I could generate 7,000 watts of solar, I'd probably get run my generators all the time. And if I could store that, I probably wouldn't need a generator probably wouldn't need a um, to do this alternator upgrade we're gonna do and we could just put a lot of batteries on and be happy uh, except for when it got really cloudy and then we'd be really sad uh, but probably wouldn't be as hot then so that's okay not doing that um, so instead uh, we put on about 3,000 watts of solar uh, and that'll generate that about 17 kilowatt hours a day on average that I that I talked about. Um, there's two separate solar systems. I mentioned before that one from Lagoon that I'm not so happy with. So basically what we're gonna do, and I'm gonna explain more of this next week, is we've isolated the two systems. I've left the Lagoon factory system alone and we'll put a little energy into that factory system and that runs a ton of stuff on our boat. It runs, it's a 12 volt system. <clears throat> it's all wired up, we don't need to mess with it. It runs the, um, fans, the 12 volt DC fans, it runs the lights, it runs the radar, the sonar, the winches, the autopilot, um, it runs the refrigerators in a lot of circumstances, and it runs all of our heavy duty electric winches. Most of this boat uh, is electric. I think all of the winches on our boat are actually electric. I haven't seen them yet, but it said convert all winches to electric. So I think that means all winches, including the uh, two flat winders it has. One is for the dinghy. It raises the dinghy up on this uh, gantry system and at the back of the boat. And the second one is the uh, flat winder for the traveler is also electric. So you don't have to winch your uh, traveler back and forth. If you don't know what a traveler is, we'll talk about that when we talk about sales in a couple of weeks. Um, just 
a little bit. We did buy our cool new spinnaker yet. I'll flash up a quick picture of it. Pretty excited about it. Very Wyoming. Uh, but uh, I figured if I put the horse on there, my wife would uh, let me buy my sail, and she did. So it all worked out. Um, the That lagoon system charges off 12-volt alternators from the engines and the solar system that lagoon put on the back, and that's enough to keep that system very well charged under most circumstances. It also charges off solar, shore power, and it also will trickle down from our other system in emergency situations. Lagoon supplies you 500 pounds of batteries with this um, that they charge you 2,000 extra dollars for for the 500 pound batteries and they're still AGMs and they still suck. So um, I didn't want them. Uh, I'm getting rid of them and we're going to get lithium back there. Uh, it's We'll put one lithium battery in place of the three uh, AGM batteries. That lithium battery is 60 pounds and is more power than the 400 pounds, so we're going to save 240 pounds there. Uh, why do I care about weight? I'm not a racer. But when you get up into thousands of pounds of difference or several hundred pounds of difference, it actually does matter. Um, your boat will just go faster all the time for less. It'll sail better. It'll go through waves better. It won't be so uh, hobby horse. Those batteries are actually pretty far back in the boat, so taking that weight out of the back is great. Uh, we're also taking weight out of the front with the generator. So Talked about the 12 volt alternators. Each one of those alternators is a 125 amp alternator. Uh, again, we talked about wattage for a second there. So if you say they put out just under three kilowatts if both engines are running, both the Yanmar diesels are running at their normal output. Now the Yanmars on our boat are upgraded. They're 57 horsepower Yanmars. Uh, 1.5 kilowatts per generator is three horsepower. So they put a three horsepower drag on the engine when they're charging, which is most of the time. So that's good to know. Three kilowatts um, basically will fill our battery banks in half an hour, even without the solar systems running. Uh, the solar system will uh, top our batteries off when the sun's up uh, at the 500 watts it's putting out over a 12 hour day, that should be another six kilowatts that it uh, puts into the battery bank. So as the battery bank's draining out, it's constantly filling it and the engines also can top that off. Shouldn't be a problem, especially since we won't ever run any inverters off this battery bank. And that's what most people have to do to get any sort of AC power at any point when they're not starting their generators. They have to run an AC up this house battery bank, putting more drains on it, more loads, and it's just not that great a battery bank. It's a small bank of batteries meant to power the main systems. But we saved a lot in labor not having to integrate this all into one system. And also by keeping our other system at 48 volts, it cheapens our installation cost because 48 volt systems use way less uh, amperage for the same amount of power. So a 48 volt system uses one quarter the amps to deliver the same number of watts which means that you can use way smaller wires. Wires are made of copper. Copper is expensive. Copper wires add weight, they add size, they add problems with the system. 48 volt systems are, are far superior. Now, the other thing is that the, the alternators in the 48 volt world are way, way, way better. So Balmar makes a unit that actually each alternator cranks out five kilowatts of electricity now, across our two alternators, that comes out to 10 kilowatts, which is more than the generator we're going to add back in uh, puts out. Uh, and that's anytime you're running your engines. Now, this comes at a cost. We're now taking 11 extra horsepower out of the system. So we started out with 57 horsepower. We're down to, if we run both alternators at full draw, we're down to 43 horsepower. But that's basically the stock Lagoon horsepower output. So we're back to just what a set of stock engines would be. But there's another trick here, which is that these alternators actually have a low power uh, wire. And if you trip that wire, you reduce their draw by um, 75%. So if you don't really need the charge as much and you're going on a long cruise and you're like, well, I don't really want to be, I want to have my engines be as fuel efficient as possible and my solar's running stuff. And I put these really, heavy guys in here, but today I don't need them. You can just flip a switch and they go down to a very low draw on the engine, less strain, more power for propulsion, better fuel economy. So that's the good news about that. 
Uh, the other good news is since they're 48 volt, they go right into our 48 volt lithium ion battery bank. They'll charge it very nicely. One engine will still charge very nicely too. Um, also running your diesels allows you to heat your water without running a really hefty uh, water heater. And you just don't want to know in kilowatts what, what your water heater is going to do. Um, but uh, it's, it's crazy. Um, much better to heat your engines, your water up with your diesel uh, water exchangers when possible um, and use electric showers as little as possible. It's a very expensive practice on a boat. So showers in the morning, showers at night, you're charging your batteries, you're heating your water. It's great. Uh, it's a two for one special. Uh, so big fan of that. Uh, also your water heats up much more quickly with the diesel engines than it does um, with the, the, uh, the electric version. Um, I think we've covered a lot there. I'm just making sure I, I did make some notes. I want to make sure we covered everything. Um, so in doing this, another secondary benefit is that I'm going to decrease the number of hours on our on our generator. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears, uh, talk about the generators. The one other thing about the alternators I mentioned is that this Balmar unit we're looking at has something called an external regulator. Uh, oftentimes, all of the brains of an alternator are right in the back of it. It makes the alternator a lot bigger and especially since this is a second alternator we want it as small as possible in the engine compartment so this makes the alternator much smaller but secondly it takes this fragile electrical equipment and puts it far away from the hot engine and you can put it up somewhere where you can actually look at the readouts while the engine's uh, running and we will be doing that so that we can uh, keep an eye on our uh, uh, regulator performance and be able to adjust things as we need um, so great thing about that, you, you really do wanna have uh, an externally regulated secondary alternator or even primary alternator if you're doing a two uh, alternator system. I saw a great video recently where a guy was running two 48 volt alternators on one engine and we would be able to do that in this case if we were really trying to get every ounce of power out of the system, we could do two 48 volt alternators and run a 12 volt charger back to the batteries and we'd be able to generate 20 kilowatts off the engines, which is more like what these integral systems are doing. I don't really know what they're exactly doing, but there's a new company called Integral, and they can get you a lot of kilowatts off your engine uh, for a very short period of time to charge up a battery bank. And with 20 kilowatts running out, we would charge a 30 kilowatt bank all the way up to full again in kilowatt hour bank in an hour. Uh, so it would be a huge amount of power, um, but all of a sudden then you're usually not using a generator at that point, which is great, but you get rid of one form of uh, redundancy. And when you hear how we're going to use this generator, which I'm really excited about, uh, it's pretty cool. Now, ideally, in the best of all possible worlds, we'd buy something called a DC generator. DC generator, um, great, love them. They're a rare bird, and I couldn't find any. Uh, with this generator crisis going on, uh, my generator choices were down to uh, a Fisher Panda unit that uh, everybody says is terrible. Um, I'm just going to take everybody's word for it. Every review I read talked about design problems and uh, stuff, and this was going to be a big Fisher Panda unit. But Fisher Panda does make a small DC generator that people seem to think is pretty cool, but you can't find any. So I tried. Not going to happen. The advantage to this is that it's DC power going into a DC power bank, which means that I don't have to re-invert uh, the electrical energy that actually uh, started out uh, as AC back down to DC. Um, not going to happen in our case, so we'll just forget about that. Um, uh, we found a unit. It's a next-gen, um, ultra-compact. It's a... 9.5 kilowatt continuous power unit. So it's only slightly less than what we originally had specified for the boat, which was an 11 kilowatt Onan Marine generator. However, the Onan generator does not have a sound enclosure and is $24,000. I'll let that sink in. $24,000. Um, not great. Not something that I'd be cool with. Um, that's a lot of money. Uh, this uh, next-gen marine generator is uh, 
only 330 pounds. So all of the other systems we're putting on the boat weigh less than 330 pounds total. So we're already ahead in terms of weight, and then we're taking off that lithium ion battery system. So our boat is gonna be about 400 pounds lighter than a factory lagoon would have been with just a generator and the factory house battery system. And we're getting so many advantages. The um, biggest advantage is the fact that we don't have to run this generator very much. So uh, with Annie and I aboard, I don't think we have to run the generator, but hardly ever. But in charter, the generator will probably run about three hours a day in the late evening into the early morning, recharging the battery banks that have drained from the AC running in the three cabins. Uh, and other than that, probably never get turned on. Uh, it's gonna turn itself on. We're using an auto start that senses a voltage drop in the batteries. And when the batteries get to a specified charge level, I'm guessing we're gonna aim for 55%. Uh, we're gonna see in real world tests what we do. And I'll let you know once we get the whole system up and running and after I've tested it on our sail down to uh, Tortola, I'm gonna try to run the boat like a charterer would and then I'll have real world numbers to give you an idea of if people are running it this way, how many hours of generator time, if people run it this way, how many hours of generator time and give you an idea exactly what the, what the true benefits are in terms of that. But also this generator uses half as much fuel per kilowatt hour generated. It's a much more efficient unit so we're actually, even when we are running it, it's using way less fuel than the, than the uh, Cummins unit. Um, it's also way quieter. Uh, it's about five decibels quieter than the Onan unit, so we won't be hearing it either. Um, and because it's running so much less, we have uh, some real advantages. I need to go back and tell you, I hate generators. Um, I've had more bad experience with more generators in my life than any other component. Um, they're very much a black box when you look at them. They're, you don't know why they broke usually uh, when they break, but I have never seen a unit always run as I wanted it to. And most recently on a charter to Catalina, generator went out the first night, uh, no AC, uh, no electrical systems useful at all, um, and had to run the engines just to keep the batteries charged uh, at times. Uh, so that boat had very little solar and not enough to keep uh, a Lagoon 450 going. So uh, that was a bad experience and it was a lot of it was related to the generator. Um, you know, uh, they're usually not in the most accessible part of the boat. It's a lot of effort to keep checking them all the time. Uh, and uh, you're running a diesel engine. When you, when you run your engines in the back of the boat, you're checking your oil every day. I will bet you that no charterer has ever checked the oil on their diesel generator until it stopped working. But they're running that engine way more than the boat's engines, most of them. A lot of charterers run those uh, more than 14 hours a day. So we have reduced our engine run times uh, by 75% with this design, uh, which means a lot because Although it's a smaller unit, it has a, it has a higher uh, service interval, so it has to get serviced. It has the oil change. It's recommended every 100 hours. But at the usage levels this generator is likely to see, even in charter, we're talking about every six weeks, possibly every eight weeks. If I was using it, it would be every three months to four months. The owning unit, you need to change the oil every three weeks. Even though it's got a 200 hour service interval, it's never gonna go more than three weeks in charter without needing an oil change. And it's not gonna happen. No one is gonna check it that frequently. It's gonna get missed. Even with the best charter companies, they're gonna be backed up. Boat's gonna come back late. They're gonna run it out the next day and they're gonna be like, oh, we'll do it next week. And then once they do that, that's just a skipped service interval basically. And over time that puts wear and tear on the unit. The owning unit also needs uh, its uh, brushes, windings, um, uh, belts, all changed every 2,000 hours. Now again, if you're doing 100 hours a week, that's 20 weeks, that's less than a full year and it's almost two times a year basically. You have to do this expensive like $1,200, $1,400 service um, on your unit. Take it, take it out of work for a full day 
um, which is another $1,500. Uh, and that has to be done, aside from these oil changes that have to be done all the time, basically, and aren't. So what you're going to have is a unit that a couple of years in is going to be beat up. Um, it's not going to work right. So, uh, bad. So, um, the, I did some of the math. As I mentioned, we have this three kilowatt solar array that's going to generate um, around 16 kilowatt hours per day. Uh, usually our ACs are going to drain about 24 kilowatt hours during the day. Now remember, if we ran those engines in the morning, we already got uh, nine kilowatt hours if the engines ran for an hour, like if we motored over somewhere, switched balls, whatever, we put nine hours in there. So if you think you're going to run your engines an hour a day, that's nine of your total day's kilowatt hours. You end up running them twice because people want to take showers at night in the morning, and you end up running them for two hours a day. It's not that much on the Yanmars, and you're going places, uh, and with the alternators, you're actually loading the engines enough that it's not an unloaded uh, engine, which is something you don't want. Uh, so with diesels. Um, so with that, basically, we're going to have the engines pumping in between 9 and 18 kilowatt hours into the system a day. We're going to have the um, solar pumping in uh, around 15 kilowatt hours a day. So we're already up to 30 kilowatt hours before the generators even come on. And if those generators run three hours, that's another 30 kilowatt hours more or less in the system. So we're getting 60 kilowatt hours a day. Now, next week, I'll talk more about the use cases and how we came up with these numbers. But suffice to say, that's quite a bit of power. And, you know, at our at a short power level, that's $43 in electricity. Now, instead, if we put the Onans on there, you would run them, you would use up uh, about 10 to 12 gallons of diesel a day, as opposed to we're looking at using up, you'd still have to run the engines at some point. So you're gonna use um, about four times as much fuel to have your air conditioning. So your air conditioning is costing you 70 bucks a night uh, on a catamaran charter as opposed to 14 bucks a night on our boat. Um, big difference, uh, adds up over a week. You know, that's an extra 350 bucks. That's a couple of nice dinners out. Maybe one, depends, depends on what you do. Uh, but, but it is something. And it's also a lot more maintenance, a lot more operating costs for us, and it's a lot less reliability. If our generator breaks on this boat, you can still put the boat in charter for the week and you just tell people they gotta run the engines a bit more and you apologize, you get the engine, you get the generator fixed. If we need to pull that generator out, it only weighs 300 pounds. We can lift it out, it's 260 pounds without the sound enclosure. So you can pull it out real quick, send it out for a repair and drop it back in and uh, you can send the boat out for charter uh, as is. You can't do that with these Cummins units. Um, they're staying in there once you get them in and you gotta have a tech down there and whatever the repair is, he's gotta go down there, find the parts, order the parts and the boat's basically unusable in the tropics and charter because if you tell people who pay $12,000 or more a week, by the way, we don't have any AC, they're gonna go stay in a hotel and not be very happy with you. So the other nice thing about this system, uh, and I'm gonna get into this more next week, is the batteries are able to deliver much higher amperages uh, to um, the system so that more things can run simultaneously when you have to. Someone plugs in a hairdryer in a bedroom and you're running your dishwasher and you're running your washer dryer and you've got three ACs on, uh, the generator is going to shut down. It's going to overload. You need black smoke out of it. It's not going to be happy. It doesn't, it's not intelligent enough to manage that situation. Our boat is able to do that. It's able to handle the loads. It's just going to click that generator on sooner. Uh, and eventually one of those really high loads is going to go away. You're not going to dry your hair all day. You're not going to wash dishes all day on a sailboat. Uh, you're not going to run your water maker. You're not going to run your washer dryer all day. So uh, those loads go away um, and then the boat catches up, the generator reloads the batteries, the solar system reloads the batteries and everything goes on, but you've never tripped the system. In the other one, you're going to have a breaker flip or you're going to have the generator conk out or start 
belching black smoke, all of which are bad. So that's it for this week. It's been a long episode. Uh, next episode, I'm going to go into the brains of the system, as I said. Um, I want to put out a huge thank you to Bill Brandon uh, at Washburn's Marina. And Bill's the one who's going to help me install this whole system. We've been working together for two weeks since this problem started, uh, and we've communicated every day. Uh, he even works on weekends. I get I get emails from him about stuff, uh, texts from him. He's just been fantastic. He's a great guy, extremely no knowledgeable. Uh, he's uh, uh, N -E -N -M -E -A certified, which is, a, uh, I, think, I think, Marine Electrical Engineers. I don't know. Anyway, EA. I, anyway, he's certified. I'll put up what it is on the, on the video. Um, but he's been amazing, and I'm really excited to be working with these guys. Uh, I also want to put out a, a thanks to Ken at uh, Next Gen Power. Next Gen is making that generator for us. Uh, Ken's going to make sure we have it for the boat show so we can show it off. The boat show is only six weeks away, seven weeks away. Super helpful guy, super responsive, uh, and it sounds like a great product. We had extensive talks about it, and I'm really happy with uh, the unit we purchased. Um, I also want to thank my partners at Navigar. Uh, Phil Winter, who's the GM for uh, North America, um, has been fantastic. Uh, very experienced sailor, very experienced boater, really cares about the business, uh, and was flexible and understanding about uh, how to help us and how to get this boat ready. I hope he's going to be at the show. I didn't ask him that, but uh, he and Joaquin Luna, who I've mentioned before, have been uh, tireless in solving these problems with me and we've come up with uh, what we think is a win-win and what we think is going to be the future of charter boat electrical systems designs uh, forsaking the previous systems that uh, really are antiquated and have no place in the current market. So I'm very excited about it. I think the boat's going to be a star of the show because of this change. And I can't wait to talk about all the other fine points of the Victron systems we're installing on the boat next week. Tune in next week. One more person to thank. Uh, my wife, Annie. Uh, she's dealt with me through all of this and all the craziness where I've been waking her up in the middle of the night and just saying, I had an idea. Uh, there were about 10 drafts of this. I'll show you all those next week as well. But Annie's been amazing through all of it. Uh, I wouldn't have this boat without Annie. Uh, she's been amazing solving every single logistical problem. That's what she does. And uh, I love her dearly. She's the best. Uh, please, if this was helpful to you, helped you begin to understand this process, uh, like, comment, share, uh, subscribe. Uh, it's how we build things. I got uh, some decent comment last week on one of my videos. It was the first real, like, just random person. Uh, the other comments were people that I, that I know. Uh, so it was great to get one from a real person who had really helped. I hope to be helping more people as we grow. Thanks, guys.